It is total anarchy in the streets right now. Yes, they've been injured. There's rioting. You've started throwing rocks at me. There's no just laws, no law at all. Historic St. John's Church set under fire. God. Is this a war going on here? We're really talking about our future. What type of country do we want to be? Hello, and welcome to Holding the Line, America's fight for religious freedom. We've done a number of interviews with interesting people exploring this topic, and our journey early on took us to Matt Barber. Matt is currently the co-founder and general counsel of Christian Civil Rights Watch. He's also founder and editor-in-chief of barbwire.com. He served as an associate dean and law professor with Liberty University School of Law, and is an attorney licensed in Colorado, concentrating in constitutional law. In addition, he's an author and a columnist, writing for The Blaze, Town Hall, many others. And he appears on Fox News and many talk shows. He served in the Army National Guard, was a police officer, and an undefeated heavyweight boxer. He's a tough guy and articulates well this issue of religious freedom. The first question I asked him had to do with Engel versus Vitale, a 1962 case decided by the Supreme Court that said it was unconstitutional for state officials to write an official school prayer and encourage that it be recited in public schools. I asked him, what has happened to our schools since we removed prayer? We are seeing in our culture right now the natural consequence of removing prayer from our public schools. Um, the cultural decline that we see, the, the promiscuity among young people, teenage pregnancy, um, the embrace of, of just a vulgar culture. Um, you know, once we've uh, abandoned officially and turned our face from, from God as a nation in our public schools and allowed that vacuum that was created by the pulling of prayer and the pulling of the Bible uh, allowed that to be filled. You know, nature abhors a vacuum, and that vacuum has been filled by secularism. So secularism, uh, whereas really Christianity was the, was the official, we are a Christian nation founded on Christian principles. We're not a theocracy. We've never been a theocracy. But when, when we decided that this notion of separation of church and state meant that we, we had to scrub all reference to God, any prayer, anything in our public schools, that left a vacuum. A vacuum has been filled by opportunists, secularist opportunists who, who come in and they, they know that the minds of young people are malleable. So our, our government schools, our public schools, uh, the first thing they had to do was get rid of reference to the family, get rid of prayer, get rid of any reference to God so that they could replace it with the God of secularism, which is statism, which is the state, which is progressivism. Um, so pe when people say that we don't have an official religion or there's not an official state religion, it's nonsense. The official state religion, regrettably, has become secularism in, in the United States and our schools have become indoctrination centers where the radical homosexual agenda is pushed, uh, where um, comprehensive sex education is pushed, where groups like Planned Parenthood and the National Education Association, which partners with Planned Parenthood, are writing the curriculum for our schools, and it's uh, it's all one-sided. You know, no no talk of, of of creation or intelligent design in the schools because that's somehow religion. But the religion of of, of Darwinism and secularism, which requires more faith, frankly, uh, than it requires to have faith in in uh, the King of Kings. Uh, they're all too happy to preach from from the pulpits of our, of our public schools, uh, to, the the God of evolution um, and survival of the fittest. So this is a natural consequence of turning our face as a nation in official public policy away from God and, and relying on, we have become now a nation of, of men rather than a nation of laws. Once we abandon uh, our constitution as a fixed objective standard and the Bible, uh, the most referenced book by any, uh, any and all of our founding fathers by far, far and away was the Bible, was, was the Holy Scriptures. Now that we have scrubbed that completely, um, we should not be surprised to see the cultural rot that has taken such root in, in, a, in a waning 
United States of America. He's right. And the statistics are not good in schools. You know, when I was a kid, I remember the top problems were students cutting class and chewing gum and running in the halls. Today, three in 10 American teen girls will get pregnant at least once before age 20. That's nearly 750,000 teen pregnancies every year. You know, I remember one girl in high school getting pregnant back in the 70s. So it's changed a lot. That's why I asked Matt, can we ever get our schools back to where they need to be? God loves to, to use Gideon's armies. Um, when it seems like all the odds are against you and all the odds are stacked against you, um, God loves to take people who are broken and fallen um, and, and lift them up in, in, in small numbers, I think, uh, so that he can be glorified. I believe that's what is happening in our nation right now. I believe that's what's going to happen. I believe that revival is on the horizon. I believe that things are going to get worse before they get better uh, because, you know, a nation can only be judged in the temporal. And I believe that in, in many ways we're, we're under judgment right now. Uh, I believe that God is disciplining us as a nation. I don't think that he has turned his wrath on us because I know that there are, there are uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, there are, are righteous people, you know, and we're only, our righteousness is only found in Christ, but there are uh, people out there who are praying fervently for revival in this nation, for that we would turn officially our, our face back to God. But we may have to reach rock bottom first. And, and it certainly seems that we're approaching rock bottom pretty quickly. And there's going to be persecution that takes place. And, but uh, we know that they, they hated him and they hate us because they hated Christ. And so they're, they're going to persecute us. That's, uh, that's what we sign up for as Christians. But, but Paul tells us, you know, to count it, all is joy. But a nation can only be judged in the temporal. We as individuals... Uh, will stand before the Lord ultimately uh, and stand, stand before, you know, before the throne of God and, and, and face judgment. But um, I think that's a metaphor, really, what we see happening with, uh, as, as individuals when, when people get so caught up in their sin that sometimes they, it either leads to ultimate destruction or it leads to repentance. Um, I can say for myself, my own personal testimony, I was a mess as a young man. Um, I didn't uh, treat God's uh, daughters as he intended them to be treated. I was caught up in, in uh, alcohol and, and partying and, and, and living for the day and for the moment. And, and, uh, and, and I had, had to go through a divorce and I had to hit, hit rock bottom in my personal life so that God could take that empty shell and, and fill me with his Holy Spirit. And as a nation, um, I think we are hitting rock bottom. And when that happens, I think God will raise up a remnant and, and, and a Gideon's army. And I, and I think that is a, a ripe moment for repentance as a nation. But things are going to have to get ugly first. But I, I have a whole lot of hope for this, this country and that we will turn our face back to God. Compulsion is an interesting debate that we see many atheists argue. They say, well, you can't force my kids to believe what you believe. And it's true. Nobody can make anybody believe. We all have free will. A teacher or a coach can talk about God all day, but if a student doesn't want to believe, he won't. And here's what Matt said. Tyranny is tyranny, whether it is tyranny of the majority or tyranny of the minority. And what we see taking place in, in America's victim society today is a tyranny of the minority. It is political correctness run amok. And political correctness, I often say, is, is a, a barrier to truth and a doorway to tyranny. And so when groups like the Freedom From Religion Foundation find, uh, find themselves, create them for themselves a victim, this one person that was offended uh, because a, a teacher reference to their Christian faith, or uh, a student asks a question about Christianity and the teacher tells them all of these things perfectly constitutional, perfectly permissible. Uh, that, that This is tyranny of the minority. When, when Because one person is offended, they want to shut down free speech and, the, and free discourse and the exchange of, of, of ideas and the free exercise of religion. They want to shut it down for everybody else. That's tyranny. Uh, and, and 
That's unconstitutional. And so the Freedom From Religion Foundation does not have a legal leg to stand on. They do find, they, 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 they're very good at, at uh, court shopping and finding sympathetic activist judges uh, who will sign on to their, their revisionist view of, of the Constitution and, and of our history. But the reality is they don't have a legal leg to stand on. They don't have a historical leg to stand on. And um, they, the only way that they make any gains uh, with their, their politically correct agenda is because people uh, kowtow and surrender to, to the, uh, uh, the paper tiger. And I often say, you know, and metaphorically speaking, that the only way to take on a bully uh, when he comes after you is to just punch him right in the nose. And um, groups like Liberty Council, like uh, Alliance Defending Freedom, there are a number of religious liberty law firms out there that are, are taking on, you know, the Goliath of the, the American Civil Liberties Union. Liberty Council, for instance, has a nearly, I believe, around a 90% win record against the ACLU. So again, they're not operating from a, a, a legally sound basis. They're, they're operating from a propagandist basis, from a secularist basis, and from an activist basis. You know, as an ex-boxer, Matt knows a thing or two about going toe-to-toe -to -toe with an opponent. And there are organized groups out there who want to take away these freedoms in the United States and create a faithless society. I asked Matt how to best fight against these bullies attacking our Constitution. There's this notion in the church today that we have to be nicer than Jesus. Um, that, this, that, God, that Christ was this kind of pacifist that walked around with his hands folded together. But as I recall, he, he turned over some tables and, and cracked a whip and and uh, had, had some pretty harsh things to say about uh, a brood of vipers and, and, and a number of things, not, not attacking people in the ad hominem, not personally attacking people, but speaking truth uh, fearlessly in love, but, but speaking truth fearlessly. And, and I always say that truth, uh, for those who hate truth, truth is hate. So whether you very passively and very gingerly try to speak the truth and uh, on these issues, you're going to be called a hater. The, the atheists are, are going to hate you. And if, and if you uh, surrender, if you capitulate, if you show weakness to them, um, then, then they will see it as, as weakness and, and they, will, they will attack you. So you're going to be attacked either way. I think rather than being weak, we as, a, as the body of Christ, we need to be meek. And, and meekness does not mean weakness. And humility uh, and meekness is, is I, I always say meekness is restrained strength. So we, we need to be thoughtful in, in how we approach these things and, and how we fight these war. And this is a war. This is spiritual warfare. But we have to hit back. We have to hit back hard sometimes. And, and that means taking on in, in the courtrooms of America, taking on these bullies, these secularist, secular progressive anti-Christian organizations and taking it right to them. We, you know, we don't get down in the gutter with them, but we also don't bring a, a, a pea shooter to a gunfight. You know, we have to fight at their level and it's, a, it's an ugly game sometimes of fighting these legal battles and, and cultural battles and political battles. And uh, we have to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves as we, we carry, carry this out. So being meek does not mean, mean being weak. You know, one of the most common arguments I hear about religious freedom in schools is, well, you know, if they teach Christianity or allow Christianity into our schools, what about the Quran or Hinduism or the flying spaghetti monster? Yeah, it's a real thing. Matt had a nice response. People need to understand we have to view all of this in context and in, 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 in the context of the original founding and, and the original intent. We are a Christian nation. We were founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Thomas Jefferson was clear that the Bible needed to be one of the primary textbooks. It wasn't the Quran. It was the Bible. So from a historical uh, and a public policy standpoint, uh, we, we did not... And I, do they have the free exercise of religion? Of course. Can, can, they, can they speak? Can they, can they? Yes, they can. But the First Amendment is very clear. We, we don't necessarily, you know, if they have a prayer in school, are they going to shut down the Muslim child that wants to pray on his own time? No. And, and I, don't, I don't say that we should repress that Muslim uh, child's uh, perspective and right to, to exercise 
their First Amendment rights to, to freedom of religious expression. But by the same token, from a historical standpoint, you know, are we going to go in and demand, you know, in Iran that they, uh, which is a Muslim nation, and all these M Middle Eastern nations across the world, that they uh, have a have an equal balance. Of, uh, of Islam and, and Christianity in their public schools? Well, no, of course we're not gonna do that. First of all, you, you're likely to be beheaded if you made such an assertion or, or, or demand. But so here in the United States, we still identify in, in the high 80s, uh, per, per, high 80th percentile as Christians. We're a Christian nation in our founding. We're a Christian nation uh, in our history. And so we don't need to revise history to give uh, undue recognition, I think, uh, and overcompensate by giving undue recognition to, to these minority reli uh, religions. Do we, do we treat them with respect? Do we allow them their, their First Amendment freedoms and their religious free exercise? Of course we do, but we don't have to lose our Christian heritage and our, uh, our, our Christian identity as the United States of America. So while we have freedom of religion, does that mean all religions need to get equal time? If there was a Christian prayer, they would say, well, then there needs to be a prayer from all religions, which, as my Alexa told me, there are 4,200 religions. Many are pushing Satanism into the forum. Are they a religion like Christianity? To try to say that Satanism must be un under law and under our United States Constitution on an equal footing with Christianity is absurd. And the fact that the left, that there are leftists who try to, to make this argument with a straight face, uh, it just shows uh, how dishonest they really are. Again, we have to look at everything in context, in the context of our founding, of our nation's founding. Would our founding fathers uh, in, 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 our, in the first uh, Congress have allowed a Satanist to stand up and demand that he give a satanic prayer before Congress? Of course not. Now, I'm not advocating this, but they probably would have taken him to the stockade for being a, for being a Satanist. I, again, I'm not saying that we should be putting Satanists in the stockade, but when we, when we look at everything in context, it's ridiculous to see that the original intent of our founding fathers and the context of the United States Constitution would have given equal recognition to Satanism. They, the official policy would have been to rebuke anyone who, who was an avowed witch or an avowed Wiccan or an avowed Satanist. And so again, we have to look at this th through the prism, not just of the clear letter of the, of the law in the United States Constitution, but in the historical context, in our public policy context, in our cultural context. And Satanism is something throughout our history that has, has violated the, the uh, good sense and, 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 and the public notions of, of community, and, and, and it's an affront to the very God and, and to the very Christ that had so much respect and, and to, wh to whom our founding fathers looked in the founding of this great nation. Parents have it tough today, especially if they send their kids to public schools. I ended a talk asking him what he would say to parents who are trying to hold the line and fight for religious freedom. A few things. There is strength in numbers. So when parents in our public schools, when they see groups like the Freedom From Religion Foundation, when they see indoctrination taking root and taking place, don't, don't approach it alone. Find other concerned parents. Go before the school, the school board in numbers. Demand to be heard. Fight back. It's amazing what, what one person can do in exercising their constitutional rights here to push, push back against um, secularist tyranny. Uh, in our nation, in anti-Christian tyranny. So I, I tell people to stand up, stand firm and stand strong, to speak truth and love, not to be afraid, to rely on Christ, to pray. Uh, but, we, but beyond just prayer, we need prayer in action, prayer and action. And so when people come together uh, and, and become a unified voice against this kind of social engineering that we see occurring in our public schools, and in and, and, and all of the various institutions in academia and in our, our courts and in entertainment and, and elsewhere, uh, people need to be heard because uh, th those who hate Christ, uh, the anti-Christ left, uh, they're, they're not gonna be quiet and they're not gonna go away quietly. 
and and they're going to yell from the from the rooftops. And if we just silently sit back, and the the Christian majority in this country sits back and does nothing to respond to that, well, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Uh, they're going to get done what they want to get done and get the kind of revisionism and, and the uh, kind of propaganda and indoctrination implemented that they're trying to push if we don't fight back. So I encourage people to, to prayerfully consider standing up, writing letters to the editor, going before the school board, and, and refusing to take no for an answer. It, it, in many respects, it, we're approaching a time uh, uh, in the spirit of, of Martin Luther King Jr. and, and others who, who, when they saw injustice occurring in unjust laws uh, that were contrary to the, to the laws of nature and the laws of God, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. took a stand and they engaged in, in civil resistance. And we're at a point now in, the, in this country uh, when with secularist tyranny uh, gaining momentum that we may have to, as Christians, engage in some peaceful civil resistance to, to this type of, of revisionism. I appreciate Matt Barber for the time he gave us. Lots of interesting insight and encouragement for those of us fighting the battle. The fight continues, and you need to be informed. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and like this video, and you'll see more content coming your way. You can also read my book, Holding the Line, America's Fight for Religious Freedom. It's available on Amazon. Thanks for joining me, and keep holding the line.